Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming back. If you weren't here last week, the air conditioning wasn't on, and it was a true test of faith, you know. So, we kind of thought, well, maybe no one's going to risk it, and they're going to wait and see what happens. But we're back, and we've got a little bit of air in here, so we're good to go. I do appreciate you being here. We are in Colossians, starting chapter 2. That's where we left off many weeks ago. I'm going to do a quick review of chapter 1, and again, I seriously mean that. I uh, hope to just kind of catch things up. I'm going to read through chapter 1 and read into chapter 2 and look at the first five verses. The emphasis here is right here. As we go through this, it's going to be Christ. And it's, it's not, not religion. It's not, you know, doing good works. It's Paul's goal is that we understand and come in union, union with Jesus Christ. And by coming in union with Jesus Christ, we can be unified. He's going to talk about being unified here in, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And if we think of this right here as Christ is the center, that's the goal, knowledge of Christ, to mature in Christ. And we are out here somewhere, and our un union, when he talks about us being unified, or coming together, or being one body, it, it's not this, the illustration is not this, that here we are over here, and what we're going to do is we're all going to come together and join each other, and we're going to form this, this thing called the church, this social club, and we're going to be unified and be patient with each other and not be judgmental. This, is, this would be the Tower of Babel. This would be some kind of government or some kind of social you know, in, institution of, of where you just want to be friendly. This is the world. When he talks about us coming together and being one, it's not me forgetting your differences, you forgetting my differences, and us coming together and unifying. It's like, no, our focus is, and you're going to hopefully see this, is Christ. He's not just the creator. He is. He's also the savior. But he has all wisdom, all knowledge. Everything is revolving. Or It's not just because he's the celebrity, the greatest celebrity in all of history. And oh, ooh, ah, look at Christ, which is true. It's, he is the creator. He is the savior. His very nature, character, or who he is, his essence is in creation itself. To function creation as, as an individual, as a member of society, as a family, in, in like any kind of a scientific you know, experience. If it be studying something with chemicals or studying farming, or if it's going off into business and finances, it all comes together in Christ because He is the essence of everything. So our unity, our union is not us saying, oh, let's all get together. We got to be nice to each other. We got to save the world. We can't be divisive. We can't be judgmental. That's Babel. That's the Tower of Babel. And when Tower of Babel came together, Christ, they came down with whoever it says we went down, if it's him and the God, the Father, him and the, his angelic staff, they went down and they said, this isn't good. We're going to confuse this. And this has been being confused since the book of Genesis is this right here. God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is against human unity. Yeah, oh my gosh. You understand? I mean, this will, this will revolutionize your thinking. Christ the Creator and Savior is against human unity because humans are in rebellion towards God. And if you've got one human in rebellion towards God and they combine with another human in rebellion with God, now you've got double power against God and then you get the whole community together against God. It's the Tower of Babel. It's like, no, I'm going to make sure this doesn't, this doesn't function. I'm going to stop this. And he caused division at the Tower of Babel so that you, you couldn't even get together and you form an, an organization of building a tower, a, a society without Christ. He's not on our side. Joshua made that clear. When he sees the angel of the Lord outside of Jericho, comes across going to spy on the city, sees the angel of the Lord says, are you for us or for the enemy? And his answer was, neither but as commander of the Lord's army, I've now come to you and going to tell you what you're going to do for me. Our unity then, as Paul's going to point out here, is in Christ. If this is me, my unity with you is when I come to Christ, I learn of Christ, I transform myself into the image of Christ by learning, practicing, maturing, producing the fruit because I'm connected to the, the true vine. And you do the same thing. And you do the same thing. And we all mature in Christ. Now, how are we going to get there? You're going to have to be taught. 
You're going to have to get, first of all, you're going to have to get saved, hear the knowledge of salvation in Christ. But then you're going to have to understand a whole lot about Jesus Christ from the fact that he's the creator to the savior to the soon coming king to the one who wants to mature. You're going to have to learn his nature. You, ha- you can't do this just by learning stuff. You're going to have to have the spirit of God living in you to empower the word that's going to help transform you. And then when we all do this, now you've reached unity. Now you are a powerful institution in the earth. Now the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Over here, you are the gates of hell. Do you understand? This over here, you are Satan's tool unifying without Christ. Well, we just want to have a church that's loving and cooperative and and not divisive. It's like, right, you are a tool of the devil because everyone in there without maturing is Christ is an enemy of Christ. It may be they're saved, but still their philosophy is anti-Christ. It's anti-God's worldview. It's anti-divine viewpoint. And so even if this person, let's say this person is a believer in Jesus Christ, but they're a stupid believer in Jesus Christ because they're still thinking like the world. They haven't renewed their mind. And so they're taking worldly philosophies and trying to implement them with the world. And it is against Christ. There you go. You've got Antichrist. And eventually it's going to manifest in the rebuilding of the Tower of Babel in some kind of global world system. It's not going to be as global world system as everybody makes it out to be. Because if you read the end of the whole story, the Antichrist and that one world government, the Mark of the Beast, it, 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 it's powerful. It's dangerous. But even in the end, the, the Antichrist and his forces have to face the king of the north, maybe Russia. You know, you, 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 in eschatology, you're supposed to be watching and being alert. And so you have all these eschatological verses that Jesus taught, Paul taught, Isaiah taught, all the way from the beginning. And you keep looking at the Bible and then looking at your world situation. If it's 30 AD, if it's 70 AD, if it's the Crusades in the Middle Ages, if it's World War I or World War II, or if it's 2020 and, and all this is happening, it's like, you just keep looking at the situation. Is, is it lining up? It's like that, that's what you're supposed to do. It's like you're not going to be able to predict the end, but you're supposed to be watching and alert, knowing what does the Bible say, what's happening, how close are we? We don't know. And so we keep looking at these things, but I can guarantee you this. In the end, no, oh, I was going to say the Antichrist, he ends up being invaded by the king of the east, which, you know, most guess, obviously right now if we're looking at it on the map today, it would be China. So you've got the Antichrist trying to have this unified government, but you've got trouble with the East. The king of the North is coming down. You have battles. And some, I don't even know who the king of the South is. Now, if you go back to the Ptolemy days, the Greek Revolution, or the, uh, the Maccabean Revolt, you know, you've got that's Ptolemy in the South, the, the Egyptian Greeks, and then you've got the Greeks in the North. And that all makes sense. But if you push it over to the end times, who are these people? It's easy to say Russia or the powers in the north are going to come down against some kind of Islamic state in the Middle East that's maybe moved into the west. You've got China coming across from the east, but then it's king of the south. You know, I, mean, I don't know. I'm just you know, kind of thinking about this. Nonetheless, that's going to be some kind of a world government. That's still not going to unify. There's still, there really is no unification here because there's no, there's no target. There's no real target here except just let's just get along. Over here, you've got true unity because you've got the absolute truth. You've got the the creator, the savior, the future king of the world. You've got the one who can transform you into his very image. Not just are you following Christ. I'm going to do these things exactly right. You're going to be transformed so you're walking like Christ. We're not just having this religious experience that we're going to follow these ten rules or something. You're going to be transformed so those ten rules are that's just, you just... You're just breathing and inhaling and exhaling the word of God, taking it in and just exhaling it in your life. You're, you're part of Christ. I mean, this is true unity. And if, if we all come together in the knowledge of Christ, this is where you're unified. When the Bible talks, and this is, this is the fallacy of churches who don't want to engage Bible teaching, they don't want to, you know, everybody, you know, they, they don't want to be challenged or transformed. Everybody's okay. You're over here. You're over here. And oh, you're going to throw out a Christ word now and then or, you know, flash a cross up or use a Bible verse. But this is, you've got to be identified. This is godly. This is evil. And there are many groups out there, and I'm not talking about things that we would call terrorist groups. 
many Christian groups that are just flat out evil. They're not trying to become Christ-like. In fact, they're trying to nullify Christ, put him in the back corner, and have us all work together and have some big, you know, unified social group. And meanwhile, Christ over there. And if you read the text of Scripture, he's over there working against you or setting you up for destruction because you've rejected him. With that being said, Colossians is a church that is in, and you got the map right there on the, on the front page, in, in the middle of Asia, it's right, it's like, what was it, 7 or 11 miles south of the main road. Used, the main road used to go through it. Uh, and so it is a declining city. It's, it's, it's getting smaller. It's not as important as it used to be. Uh, there are basically four different groups here. You've got your natives that were, you know, traditionally grew up there. They've got their own language. Then the Greeks came across. You, go, you see right across uh, the Aegean Sea there, uh, you know, going to the left. Uh, the Greeks had come across and began settling on the coast, even before Alexander the Great's day, and had come in, so they had got Greek culture. Then the Romans came through, and now you've got Roman soldiers there, and Roman culture there. But also, uh, one of the Seleucid kings decided to uh, transport from Babylon a large group of Jewish citizens, not citizens, Jewish culture. They'd been taken in captivity, they never returned. He just relocated them, just pulled them up and planted them right in Colossae and they began to live. So they've got a huge Jewish presence in Colossae, in this rural, it's a rural community at this time, uh, not a large city, it's, it's a city that used to be much larger, it's fading. And so you've got the, the natives, you've got the Greeks, you've got Romans, and then before the Greeks and Romans really got a stronghold, the Jews were placed there. And now Paul, a rabbi, comes in and well, he doesn't come to Colossae, but he goes to Ephesus. And they come over and they now present to that culture the Christian message. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, in a sense, cultures there. And the true culture is the Christ culture, talking about Jesus Christ. Now the Jews are going to hear that and they're going to like resist it. The Greeks are going to try to adapt to it. The Romans just want peace. And then you've got these original people that were there originally that have ancestry going back a thousand years and and. There are typical pagan cultures and pagan traditions and legends and traditions. And they've got all that. And all that is, is trying to cooperate with Christianity or Christianity is trying to cooperate with that. And so you've got this whole group of what we would call incomplete or false philosophies, false teaching that's not going anywhere. That's why Jesus Christ came. That's why the apostles went in the world. That's why Paul was sent to the Gentiles is to proclaim this good news. And so... When they hear this, they receive it. They're excited about it. Some people get saved. Uh, but if they stop, hey, watch, if you stop teaching and you just kind of start adapting and compromising, your Christianity is going to become paganized, being pulled over into the traditional you know, culture of the, the natives, or it's going to be influenced by Jewish law or Jewish traditions, or it's going to be pulled one way, and pretty soon... You're just getting along with everybody, and you really have lost the Christian message. And it's like, well, that sounds nice, but once again, you're just, you're just going the route of battle. We're just, we're just tolerating. We're just getting along with everybody. And Paul is not about destroying the culture, but he's definitely about bringing the truth to them and having them maintain the truth. If you look on the map, Paul was in Ephesus. You can see where Ephesus is at. He's never been <coughs> to a Colossae. Uh, it's, it appears, from our best guess, or our best understanding, that people started the church in Colossae just branching out. After Paul was teaching for three years in Ephesus, people began to go out and start churches or start Bible studies or share Christ. And start. And we say churches, they're not getting, you know, their tax exemption forms and, and building a building and, and having flyers set out and, you know, and having a praise and worship band. They're accepting Christ, and then someone else accepts Christ. Now they realize they've got a new, and they're going to find strength in each other. They're meeting in someone's home. And so when we talk about church, I mean, it, it's really, you almost have to erase your modern concept because it's more like people meeting and gathering together. In fact, there's several churches meeting in different people's homes. So you've got the Church of Colossae, but it might be in five or seven different people's homes, and they meet together, and they just encourage each other in the faith, and Paul just keeps giving them information. And they're under constant pressure just like we are, to just, you know, continue in the ways of the world. So, he writes this letter, chapter 1, verse 1, writing from prison, no, 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 not prison, in, un, he's under arrest in Rome, under house arrest. I think there's a clear distinction 
between Paul's arrest in Rome between 60 and 62 AD when he's in his own rented apartment. There's a Roman guard there. But people are coming and going. Christians are coming and going. He's apparently having daily Bible studies there. The Jews come and argue with him and debate. Some believe, some don't. But he's free, and his, the case is probably going to be dismissed because it's a case that started, a, a criminal charges, from Jerusalem when Paul supposedly went, uh, went across the barrier. He could go across the barrier into the temple court, the precincts, but the Gentile that was supposedly with him uh, was illegal, and a riot broke out, so Paul was arrested. It was a false charge, but there's a big riot, and, and he ended up being arrested spent three years in Caesarea on the, by the sea in prison. Talk to uh, Festus and Felix, Herod Agrippa and Bernice. And what's interesting, and you've got to keep this in mind, that we, we have speeches by Paul in Caesarea while he's in prison for that three years when he was, would, would be called to present his case. And they almost used it like entertainment. It was almost like, Paul, tell, tell Herod what you were telling me about, about why you're in prison and what you believe. Herod, you're you're going to like this, Herod. Because Herod Agrippa had, had converted to Judaism and he was trying to follow the law. So he was interested in this rabbi who had become a Christian talking about Messiah. And you can just see, he, they let him just talk on and on and on. And then that's Luke just giving you the narration of what's being said. And it didn't just happen once accidentally. Several times it says they sometimes they call him out of prison and say, just ask him some questions. I mean, it's just like, and so when he stood before the governor Festus or the governor Felix or the king Herod Agrippa, he presented the gospel. So it gives you an idea, especially at this time in 60 to 62 AD, when he appears before Nero or Nero's court, that he just doesn't stand there and, and sob or he just doesn't stand there and they bring accusations against him. They're going to, you know, they had a legal system. Present your case. It appears he doesn't have a lawyer because he's trained as a lawyer. And so he's probably defending his own case. He doesn't have someone to come alongside him. He just presents. So when it comes time to present his defense, he's not going to say, well, you know, you should probably let me go because I really didn't mean that. I don't want to cause any trouble. He's like, I've been brought here because of, and just read what he says in Acts, because of my faith in the resurrection, because of Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah, Herod Agrippa. You know about the promised anointed one. Well, we believe, and just like lays down, it's like, and even Herod ends the thing and says, whoa, whoa, Paul, whoa. Do you think I'm going to become a Christian that quick? It's like, let's, let's back off a little bit. I'm interested in what you're saying, but I'm not, we're not going to have a conversion right here. And you can read that in the book of Acts. So when he appears before Nero in 6062, while he's writing this letter, you can bet that Nero heard the gospel. And then you go to 2 Timothy, where he's now in a different situation. Now he's, he's in a dungeon. He's in a prison. He says very clearly he's on his way to his execution. When he's writing in these letters like Colossians and Philippians, writing these what we call prison epistles, there's a, he's hopeful. It's like, I'm, you know, I'm waiting for the decision. I've made my presentation one or two times, and I'm pretty sure it's, I'm going to be dismissed. It's, it's not going to stick. Because it's a Jewish charge in front of Nero, and it, it appears, potentially, I, I'm, I'm boring you here, but it appears that the, uh, the Jews that brought charges against him, they wanted Paul killed in Judea. And so that's why they had him transferred from Jerusalem to Caesarea so they could attack him and kill him on the way. The reason he stayed in prison so long was the Jews just kept dragging on the case. They wanted a chance to kill Paul. So when it realized that, actually, if you go back and read Acts, Herod Agrippa and, and Festus and Felix, they, they heard the case like, actually, there's, there's no charges here. I mean, this man is innocent. Clearly, this is just a political thing. They just don't want him preaching the gospel. He was there for three years. And, and Felix says, I know, except he's appealed to Caesar. Because Paul knows that once they take the chains off, and you see movies like this, you know, they let someone go back out, then the mobsters kill him. As soon as, soon as Paul walked out of prison, the Jews that had hired assassins were going to kill him as soon as he got out of prison. So he's like, uh, I appeal to Caesar. It's like, and that was a Roman right, which means now... The governors, they can't say, yeah, well, no, we're not going to do it. It's like a Roman citizen has just appealed to his local governor. I want my case heard by Caesar or Nero. I mean, imagine that, asking for that privilege. And so they go, well, to Caesar you go. We'd set him free. Yeah, but I'll get killed right out there. Put me on a ship and send me to Rome. And so they send him to Rome, and you know the shipwreck. I and mean, when he gets there, it's a good chance the Jews 
never showed up to follow up their other charges because they're not really charges. It was just something they were stirring up. It was like a, a you know, maybe you can imagine uh, a local riot and just, you know, burning buildings and causing a commotion. And as soon as it gets pushed out of the city into a real court situation, it's like, this is, this is ridiculous. You have no case. But there, in the midst of the chaos, it's like, oh, just don't make anybody mad. And that's kind of what it was. It's like, Paul's like, they've got just chaos going on there in Judea trying to kill Paul. And he's like, why don't you send me to Rome? I'll talk to Caesar. So he goes to Caesar, and Caesar hears the case, eventually, a couple of times, and it appears, dismisses it. So, the second, last time, in, in 67, he's in prison on his way. I'm gonna, I want to say this, this is important. In fact, let's go to let's go to 2 Timothy. This this is important for this is important for me, just personally as I was reading this. Um, now I've got to find it here exactly, and uh, and and it it's, it fits into um, what we are looking at today. Okay, I'm looking, looking. I'm looking for the lion's mouth. There it is. Chapter 4, verse 16. And you can hear the court case in here. Paul says in chapter 2 Timothy, chapter 4. And this is important. This is important for you to understand this. this and I, I'm, I'm not mocking you or making fun of you because I'm sure you understand this, but I'm, I want to make this, I want to draw a line, a very clear line right here, a very clear line. You, you can't even confuse it, is Paul is going to present his defense. And of what kind of defense? I didn't do it, sir. I didn't do it. Probably not. His defense was probably the reason I've been caught and I'm in trouble is because I believe in the resurrection from the dead. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in forgiveness of sins or whatever. And you, what, what was he saying? You can read in Acts probably what his defense was if whatever he presented to Festus or Felix, which were Romans, is similar to what he's going to present in court in Rome. He's not there trying to get out of trouble. He's there trying to do his job as a Gentile or an apostle to the Gentile. So here he says right here, and it would appear that there's maybe a couple times he's got to appear before Nero and present his case. Because he says right here, I mean, this is the second time. Now he's in a dungeon and he's on his way to his execution. He's already said it. He said, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. He says, I'm going to be executed. He's, he's confident. I'm not going to make it. I've run the race. I've, I've fought the fight. I've, I've, or I've finished the faith. I've uh, finished the race, kept the faith, fought the fight. I mean, he says, now's it. I mean, he's saying, goodbye. They're going to kill me. But yet he says this. Verse 16, at my first offense, no one came to my support. Now, the reason for that is, at this time, Nero's been killing Christians. Paul, or Peter's already been crucified. If you come up, stick your head up out of the hole, say, I'm a Christian, you're, you're an instantly illegal. So no, there's no one in Rome going to step up and say, hey, I want to defend Paul, because you may die with Paul. In fact, Timothy is released in the book of Hebrews. As Timothy's been released from prison, and Hebrews is written right around 67, maybe 68 AD. People would date it. I date it that way. You know, you don't know for sure. But that would mean when Timothy comes to visit Paul... He would have been arrested, and after Paul's execution, he would have been released, because it says in Hebrews that Timothy's been released, I'll bring him with me when I come to Jerusalem, if you put that together. So Christians are being arrested. So no one comes to my support, but everyone deserted me. Now this is positive, because it says, may it not be held against them. It's not because they betrayed him, it's not because they're trying to burn Paul, it's because... We're all going to die if we... He said, Paul says, no, I don't expect you to come and die with me. So he's not... Hold, now, there's other places he says, may the Lord hold it against me. May the Lord judge them. People that have been in his ministry team that have betrayed him. He says that earlier. May the Lord hold it against him. May the Lord bring him to account. Here he says, no, I understand. If, if Paul's going to be executed, just let him go. And that, he said, I don't hold it against him. Now watch this, but the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength at his first defense when he was presenting his case, which means he's presenting the gospel and the message to the Gentiles to Nero and his court. So that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. Now when he says all the Gentiles might hear it, he's going to have gone from Antioch 
all the way through Galatia, Ephesus, going through, uh, you know, what we'd say, uh, uh, Achaia, Greece, Macedonia. He's come all the way now. He's in Rome at the top of the stack in Caesar's court. And so the, from the streets of Asia to the palace in Rome, that all the Gentiles might hear it. And I, now watch this, get this, this is my point right here. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. Now, if you read that in the Western mind, the lion's mouth is prison and your execution. They almost had me and they were going to kill me. But I was delivered. The Lord stood by my side and I was delivered. So where are you at now, Paul? Oh, I'm back in the dungeon. They're going to execute me here as soon as I get a chance. Well, what do you mean you were delivered from the lion's mouth? Well, all of a sudden you realize the lion's mouth is not, not martyrdom. The lion's mouth is not getting your head cut off. What's the lion's mouth? The lion's mouth is to stand in front of Caesar or anybody and have a chance to present the gospel like you were called to and go, uh, I'm sorry. That's the temptation. The temptation, the lion, Satan wants you to shut up. And right here it is. So that through me the message might be fully proclaimed to all the Gentiles. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue from every evil attack. If you read that with Joel Olstein, that means you'll never get sick. You'll never have a problem. All your finances will be resolved. Every, no, this is every time you have a chance to present the gospel, God will be there with you, strengthening you. And you can present the gospel right in the face of evil and be delivered from the lion's mouth and be fearless. And then they'll kill you. It's like, well, uh, I, I, I want to be delivered. You were. Satan was trying to stop you from speaking, and you spoke. So you understand the contrast right here? I mean, if you read this, and you can talk about, you know, put this on a little Bible verse on the refrigerator. God's going to deliver you. God's going to save you. All this stuff, you know, don't have to worry about the evil attacks. It's like, well, no, that's not talking about temporal things. That's talking about the eternal mission of you presenting the gospel. In this case, Paul. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. He's not afraid of dying. He's not afraid of being in prison. In fact, that kind of comes with it. If you're going to, con if you're going to confront the world with the gospel... The world's going to resist you. They're going to kick back, bite back, put you in prison. You might be executed. But did you present the gospel? Yes, I did. So you were delivered from the temptation of evil. Yes, I presented the gospel. And now I'll be delivered safely into the heavenly kingdom. Yeah, but you got your head cut off. I mean, we're not going to get out of here alive. I mean, but you may get out of here without presenting the gospel. You may live your whole life in fear, hiding. That's Nero, that's his court. And never step up and you're going to be taken by the line because of fear, of, of you're afraid of dying or something. So that's just an amazing set of verses right there. And it kind of helps me. And it says, to him be the glory forever. Do you, do you see that? Does that make sense to you? I mean, does that draw that line, right? Do you see? Because you can't say, well, see, God was there. It's not like Daniel being delivered from the line. Again, God delivered Daniel. And God can deliver you from the line or the disease. I mean, we see Jesus doing that throughout his ministry. We see the church. The ministry of God is to deliver you from all things. But Paul here is not talking about avoiding persecution or hardships or prison in a dungeon or even decapitation. His concern, Paul's heartbeat, his concern was that when it came time to speak, that he not be intimidated. In fact, as you can see in some of the letters, he says, pray. Even from these prison letters, he writes, pray. If you want to pray for me, pray that I would be bold and I would be clear in my presentation. If you want to pray, pray, no, pray, get out of prison. I don't deserve to be here. No, no, no. This is a good opportunity. There's prison guards. They're coming and going, watching me teach all day long. In fact, in, in one of the letters, the Philippian letters, the prison guard, the Praetorium, which is Caesar's personal military. He says, even the Praetorium, he says that we got believers in the Praetorium now. Why? Because I'm in Rome. I'm in chains. Like they got to hold me. They got to chain me. Caesar's prisoner or guards have a chain on me all the time. And anytime I talk to the Christians or debate with the Jews, they're in it. And they get right. What do you think? 
You know, and it's like, now they go back and they start sharing and he's able to say, he says, this is all working out perfect because I'm now in Rome and the Praetorian Guard has believers in there. It's like, so his prayer was not, make sure your church is praying, please be faithful, pray that I get out of prison. No, no, no. His prayer, please pray that I may be clear in my presentation and that I would be bold and not fearless in my presentation. Well, should we pray that you get out? No, well, whatever God wants, but I mean, what an opportunity. I'm chained to the Praetorian Guard. They're stuck with me. But make sure I'm making it clear to them. So you understand his, his position. I mean, you understand how the Western church would be like, what? How, how, how's that a positive thing? Uh, how far have we fallen? How, how, I mean, it's like, we're afraid. I'm afraid. I mean, I'm West. I mean, how can you be critical of the Western world? Uh, I'm it. I, I know how the Western world thinks because I grew up, I'm him. I, I am the Western world. I don't want problems. I don't want brown grass in my yard in July. I want green grass. I, I, it's like, God, why is my grass brown? I've been watering. It's like, I gotta, it's like, I've got problems in my Western world. My grass isn't green. Who are you making fun of? Me. That's my world. You understand what I'm saying? And I've got to go back to the public school this fall. And I'm not sure what it's going to look like. The maths are one thing. But I, yeah, so, whatever. But there's other things that have been building since the 1800s all the way through. And we may be at a, a crash point. And I'm looking at retirement. I mean, just one more, two more years. And it's like, it's like, I, 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 don't, I, I don't want to cause any problems. It's like, but pray that I'm bold and, and make it clear. And, well, what about your retirement? It's like, well, really, that's why I spend most of, my, most of my time I spend thinking about my retirement. You understand? It's like, how do I just weasel through, stay under? It's like, no opinion here. <laughs> you know, I don't know. It's like, and it's how personal that becomes for me. So, I mean, that's why that's kind of important. And so, I mean, when I talk about the Western world, it's not like, you're judgmental of my own heart. And I figure when I compare churches and the Babel church, it's like, it's an easy shot because I know exactly what they're thinking. Okay. That was not even in the notes or in my thoughts, but I, I, I like that. I don't know if you like that, but it's... It's interesting to see Paul write that way. Colossians. Anyway, Paul now is in. He, he's in, not that second imprisonment, in the first imprisonment where he's probably going to be out. Both imprisonments, he's going to be bold and talking and teaching. And now he's writing to the Colossians. And it appears the pastor of the Colossian church has come over and brought Paul some kind of relief, some kind of funding, some kind of you know, refreshments, you know, snacks, whatever, and, and, and brought him a report. And Paul now is going to send a letter back to the church leadership to address some of the issues. And the issues are just like what I had listed here. They've got five different cultures in a sense, at least. And, they're, and the Christians have to hold to their truth and not be compromised into the others. And here we go. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. To the holy and faithful brothers at the, uh, in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints. The, love, the, the faith and love that spring from hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. So in other words, they've heard the gospel. They now realize there's hope in the future, in eternity, in heaven, which gives them faith and love manifesting in their life which brings them to unity because they're unified around Christ where the truth and faith is based in the hope that's in eternity that they've heard about and have accepted. All over the world, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing. In other words, what's happening in Colossae is no different. This is good news for us. Whenever you speak the word of God, you know, we know it doesn't return to you empty. The same thing is here. It's like all over the world, you preach the gospel, there's going to be, you can't plant seeds without a crop coming up. Now, some people may dig the seed up, 
drown it out or overwatered or underwater or whatever. But somewhere that seed on the good soil is going to start to grow. That's why we're afraid of people teaching and proclaiming false doctrines. Now, again, I mean, if it be, you know, in academics, in, in college, if it be in churches, because they, they produce seeds. We talk about that in Hosea. You sow the wind, you'll reap the whirlwind. You sow a false philosophy, you reap a whirlwind of catastrophe because those don't work. Thus, where we're at in our society. We've sown the seeds of vanity. I mean, not, not vanity or, or, or vain things, but vain thinking, empty thoughts, empty philosophies. And now we've got a generation or two that now have based their life on those weeds and they're now producing the fruit of those weeds. And it's like, it's the whirlwind. How do we stop this? You go back to 1960 and don't plant this in people's hearts. You don't teach this to kids in the 70s. You don't produce it and, and let it get into the media and Hollywood and music in the 80s and 90s. And now here we are. Well, what's going on? Press down, shake it together, running over. You're reaping what your society has sown. It's like, well, how can you know that? Okay, you explain it. It's like, what's happening? It's, it's the harvest. Nonetheless, the word of God, we want this preached and you'll have hope. And this comes into all the world, the gospel bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace. You heard it and had to understand it in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras. There you go. There's your pastor that went over there and started the church, but he was probably with Paul in Ephesus. And he's the one that brought the gospel because this is what happens. You hear it, you want to share it. You hear it. The natural desire is you go out and proclaim it. And Epaphras did this. Our fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, serving for Paul, spreading his message, and also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you, asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. Now we heard that you got saved, we would say, and you've come to Christ. Now we pray that you continue to grow, that you're filled with the knowledge of his will. You've got to learn it now. You don't just suddenly know it. I'm now magically a Christian. I know God's will. You've got to reprogram your brain. You can see this in Philippians. You can see this in Romans chapter 12. You've got to learn. So we're praying that as we teach you, you would grow through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. If you learn these things and are transformed, you'll be able to live and produce fruit in your life, the things you say, the things you do, worthy of the Lord, and may please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you might have great endurance and patience. Notice God's coming along and providing. You're not alone. You're not on some kind of academic trip trying to figure this out. You're learning, but the Spirit of God is coming through and empowering you to understand it, and it's going to now help you have endurance and patience, which means this is not good. You're not, you're not in friendly territory. You are in an area that seeds like this are destined to be persecuted. And so you're going to have to have endurance and patience. And joyfully giving thanks to the Father. While you're having persecution and enduring, you're happy. You're joyful. Not just happy giddy, but it's like, I know what's going on. I'm being attacked because of the Word of God. Yeah, we're making progress now. Look, I might get killed. All right. They see the persecution. They, it's like, they know that I'm making a difference. It's like, how can you be joyful when you're having to endure? Because that means we're making progress. There's opposition. And it's like, I don't want opposition. I want everyone just to let me water my grass. Anyway. And joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has already rescued you from the dominion of darkness. And now it goes back to where you were. And you didn't even know you were here. From the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. In other words, there's the kingdom of darkness. And now you've been transferred to the kingdom of light. You're now in his kingdom. Why well, didn't even know I was over there? Exactly. That's why we have to explain. You are, and again, this is basic, basic teaching. Uh, it, it, philosophically, politically, is there are two groups. Understand this. You want to break all the politics down. There's two groups. There are those who recognize that me, you, everybody has a sinful nature. That within me is the deepest, darkest wickedness. 
Not that I've developed it, but it, 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 humans can become very evil. And you've seen evil people. They're not unique. We're all that person. It's just some of us have had some kind of control, if it be parenting, if it be the gospel, if it be society, all the things that God established, government, uh, nationality, uh, authority, is your own conscience, is to help you manage the fact that you are a dangerous, wicked, sinful person. We all are. So be careful. Not everything you think is right. Okay, that's one group. And we base our politics on that. We need some laws. Because I don't trust you, and you shouldn't trust me. Why? What are you saying? I'm saying I believe in the sin nature of mankind. Well, that's judgmental. That's reality. Well, we don't like that. Okay, well, here's your other option. Everybody is inherently good. We all want what's best for each other. So, there's nothing wrong with us. It's these people over here that keep pointing a finger at us, identifying these things. Because if I'm good, and I think it, it's okay. Because I thought it. I think this would be a good thing to do. If it be some sexual thing, or some financial thing, or some social activity, or whatever. It's like, I'm attracted to that. It must be a sign of my goodness pursuing a new creative avenue of expressing my human goodness. So, don't tell me what's right or wrong. Let me experience it. And I want to share with you my thoughts. I was thinking and start telling you all the wickedness. And the thing is, according to this view, that wickedness just keeps unfolding. It's like, when are we going to reach the bottom? Oh, you never do. It, 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 you can't reach the depth of depravity. So you've got a group over here that wants just freedom of expression, and anyone who hinders that freedom of expression or wickedness is a problem. So we're going to make laws over here that just expand and whatever you want. Don't hinder me. This group over here says we got to be careful because we can become very, very corrupt. Everything we do has a, has a potential of becoming twisted. So we need checks and balances because we want to walk in the truth. You understand the difference. And you can break down everything and we can go on and on like that. You can pick out which political party goes which side. Now again, we're still, we still want freedom of expression, freedom of, of thought. But part of that freedom of thought is to be able to say, I think mankind is wicked and we got to be careful. Over here, the freedom of thought is I want to express my wickedness however I want to express it, and you can't tell me it's wicked, and you can just see how that continues. And we're at that, that place right here where we're trying to decide as a culture which one, these are always going to be there, but what are we going to support in our academics, in our churches, in our movies, in our music, in our politics? And if we lean this way, these people will become very, very evil. And anyone who wants to identify the sinful nature is you're judgmental, you're limiting people, and you can just see how this is backfiring. Meanwhile, over here, if we go this way, and you could get, there's a problem with this group too, because then they want to stifle everything, and it can quench growth and expression and art. So there's a place of, of that's why we've got a kind of a balance of, in our, in our government, of, of freedom of expression, but there has to be some kind of law on how far you can go with certain things. And now I'm getting out of my pay grade. But understand, watch this, the sin nature, the recognition of sin nature or not is, well, we say people are bad because of what's inside of them. These people say people are bad because of what society did to them. So if you find bad people over here, it's society's fault. If you find bad people over here, it's their fault. They're born with, we're all born with a sin nature. Now society can along and help them with good parenting, and now we get into the institutions. Okay. Uh, I was qualified. Okay, we were, okay, here we're talking about this. Verse 13, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So that's where we've been delivered from. We have a chance now in this unity in Christ to now mature 
and find unity, not, not in your ideas or my ideas, but in Christ. He is, now again, watch this, the emphasis here, I don't want you to miss this, the emphasis here now is on Christ. It's not on what you do, it's on Christ. And so here he's going to identify Christ. One of the great verses, the Christological verses, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, powers, rulers, or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. And that is the point. If you don't have Christ, you have no idea what you're doing. If you have Christ and are growing in Christ, you are connected to the one who has supremacy over everything. For God was pleased to make all of his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his body shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds, notice minds, because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you to Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, establish and firm, not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now Paul talks about his ministry. Now I rejoice in what, I, in what was suffered for you, Christ, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions. Meaning, to fulfill Christ's ministry in the church, you have to suffer. Again, be careful with that. That can become an extreme. But Christ suffered, but he's also called us to suffer. He's not just called us to the glorious life. We have life, but we're going to present that option or the truth to the world. And just like Christ suffered bringing the truth, the apostles suffered bringing the truth. If we're going to follow, there's going to be suffering bringing this truth because the world is hostile to it. The world wants battle. We're preaching Christ. And our unity is going to be when we grow in Christ and we're together in Christ. There's no unity over here. And the world wants this. If you want to compromise the unlawful world, you preach this. Your church can float for a long time until the Muslims take over. Right over here preaching some kind of social gospel. But you're, not, you're going to get along with the world. Over here, we want unity with Christ. You're going to have to preach Christ, and that's what he's doing right here. And that's what he says. I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is the lacking guard of Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant uh, by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The point being there, if God had not revealed it through Jesus Christ, if God had not commissioned the Apostle Paul and others to go to the Gentile world, the Gentile world would still just be in one of those four, the, the native believers in you know, whatever they believe in, Colossae, the Greeks, the Romans, or the Jews that were imported, they would still be lost trying to figure out what's up and what's down without having this message. So the, he says, I've been commissioned to bring this to you. We proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor. In other words, I want you saved, Paul says, but I also want you to grow in knowledge, be unified in Christ, so we can present you someday to God the Father as a church of Colossae. Look how they've matured. Look how they've grown. They are complete. Now that's, that's his goal. We see it throughout Paul's ministry. He doesn't just want people born again. He wants them to mature in Christ and see the complete. To this end, I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Paul is suffering. He's even going to go to his death eventually. But he realizes and he recognizes that he experiences the power of God taking him. Through. He's facing very, look at the things Paul did. But Paul just kept on going. I mean, from being stoned to being, you know, whipped to being beaten with rods we read, in prison. But Paul kept going because he says... I labor, but I'm laboring with the strength that God provided. I mean, it's very interesting because to do the things that God has called someone to do, and they've got to face this persecution, there's going to be a grace that comes with it to empower them. And that's the joy that you would have, Paul talks about it, that we all can experience when we're doing the thing that God has empowered us to do. And again, sometimes it takes maturity, it takes time to 
iron those things out and figure it out. But there's going to be a strengthening. Not only are you laboring, but there's a power source that you maybe can identify. Maybe you can't. It's just your God is driving on. Paul recognized in his own ministry. He says, I labor extensively, but I'm being I'm being helped and uh, empowered by the things of God. And so now we come to chapter 2, verse 1. And I've got a few notes right there. I'll read through this. So now he says in chapter 2, but with that building, this is new material finally. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those in Laodicea and for all the who I have not met and or who have not met me personally. Looking at your notes very quickly. Here you can see right there you've got the English Standard Version at the top with the inter interlinear underneath it, page 1. For I want you to know how great a struggle. The word struggle is, it means a gathering, a contest, a struggle. It's the image of an athletic contest. It's a word right out of Greek. It, it refers to the athlete struggling in the, the competition. If it be wrestling, if it be track, whatever ath athletic sport they were having there in Greece, you can refer to. The athlete is striving, straining, suffering, enduring, and overcoming. That's all within that idea. He's struggling. He knows he's going to overcome, and he's going to be victorious, but he's not just walking in and waving to the crowd, hi, I'm the winner. You're not the winner until you engage in the competition, and you're going to have to struggle. So Paul sees his ministry. He's never even been to Colossae, but he's struggling for them. Now, how is he struggling? I think I've got that written down next. And you can see the map there. You can see who those places are. He mentions Laodicea. It's just a, a you know, the book of Revelation, uh, those seven churches. Uh, if you see, like, uh, the Laodiceans were the church that he, that he says, I want to spit you out of my mouth because you're neither hot nor warm. And you know this. But you see where Laodicea is on the main road to the north is Heropolis, where they had hot springs. Just to the south of Laodicea is Colossae. And that's where they had cold springs or cold water, fresh water. Laodicea, as is mentioned here in this verse, and you can see, you can go there and see it today. The pipes from this time period are laced with with uh, with uh, uh, calcium deposit, lime. It was just putrid water. They did not have wa good water because they're low in the valley. They always had bad water, and so they would have to pump in fresh water from the south. But by the time the cold water got there, it gone through those limed pipes, and it was putrid. The hot water in the north, by the time it got there, they'd have to go up to Hierapolis because they themselves couldn't have hot water. So you had hot water in Hierapolis, cold water, fresh water springs in the south. But Laodicea had putrid water, lime water. You'd want to spit it out of your mouth. And so Jesus says, I mean, that's a, the illustration probably comes from that very point. It's not precise, but they had, the, they had a water problem. So he says, you're neither hot nor cold. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. The word is actually vomit in the Greek, but... That's harsh. Um, page two of the notes. Three groups of people who are addressed here. There's people in Colossae in the church who knew Paul, maybe because they met him in Ephesus, and then they came over and were part of the church, maybe went back and forth. There's another group in the church of Laodicea that has not met Paul because the people from Colossae apparently went up and started the church in Laodicea, and they're be meeting in, in, a, in a house. The person's name is even mentioned here in the, in the text. And then the people who joined the churches in Colossae and Laodicea that have never met Paul. So the only people that have met Paul are those that apparently have been in Ephesus, heard him, met him, and have come back and forth and helped start Colossae and helped start the church in Laodicea. And he says, I'm struggling for you because I want to come and be with you. But he's struggling probably in prayer, probably making sure they're on track. This letter would be included. He hasn't, he understands the importance. Not just that they're saved, but you've got to be face to face with the truth. So he's struggling with them. And I write this, Paul 1.3, Paul wants to see these believers face to face. He's already said that uh, because that is part of his commission identified in uh, Colossians 1.25. I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given me for you Gentiles to make the word of God fully known. So in other words, he wants to meet them because he knows, Paul knows, not because he's the great man, but he knows he's commissioned by God to speak to the Gentiles. And they're doing fine over there in Colossae with Epaphras and all the other people that have been involved in Paul's ministry. But he says, I want to come and see you face to face so I can help you get to this center. And that's where we're heading right here in these next verses. And for all of you who have not met me personally, my purpose, and I've got this on the board, he's going to say these things. 
purpose, and the NIV adds that word purpose in there. You can see your NIV or the interlinear. But he's going to identify his purpose, the target, and the end game. In these next verses, two and three, you're going to see this right here. His purpose is that they be joined together. And this is where a lot of, like I was talking about earlier, a lot of pastors quit right here. We want everyone to come together. We're going to have a potluck afterwards. We're going to play a little bit of badminton. We just want, we just have a fellowship of love. We just love each other. Okay, are you building battle? Or, or what? No, no, you're, you're here. He wants them joined together to manifest the full riches. Potlucks and playing badminton out in the churchyard doesn't help you manifest the full. It helps you manifest. Why well, just feel so comfortable here? I mean, Babel was a beautiful place. Everybody spoke the same language. We all cooperated. We got building this big building. This was so awesome. And God says, let's go down and tear it down. Now, he didn't tear it down. He just confused them. Because the full riches are what? The end game to know Christ. That is your target. Your target is not to get along with each other. Well, we just want to get along. Well, I can tell you how to get along. Don't talk about anything. Just eat food and play badminton and make sure everybody gets a turn to win. And we'll do it again next week. Make sure you got air conditioning on. And you can, everybody's happy. We just love each other. What are you talking about? Some, a social group, a card club, a sports team? What are you... The goal is to know Christ, which means every one of us who has a sin nature has to be brought under the authority of the word of Christ and transformed into the image of Christ. That's a lot of work. So who, who are we going to copy? None of us. You're all losers. You need to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And when you get there, I'll meet you there and we'll have unity in Christ. No one's interested in that. Can we just have like food, badminton, a lot of fun and, 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 and join together? And skip start the, the target, the end game. It's like it look it looks the same if you're ignorant, but until the culture starts rolling over you and starts shoving stuff down your throat, and there's goes, well, that's not what we want. Well, you've got no dip. Well, here we go. You got no defense. They're gonna roll right over you. You don't have the truth. Oh my notes. Uh, chapter two, verse two, that their hearts may be encouraged. Being knit together in love, a lot of people want to use that word love, and they should, but in context, to reach all the riches of the fullness of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. The love is in Christ. You, as a sinful creature, are not bringing love to the group. Oh, I hate that. I just, I mean, I just cringe. When you meet some Christian, little Christian person, it's like, I just don't love you. I just want to love everybody. It's like, until we come against you, and then you're going to despise us and hate us. There's only one way you're going to love me, is that is in Christ, when we, I'm shooting for Christ, and you're shooting for Christ, and we meet in Christ. Because if you're looking at me, telling me you love me, it's kind of like, I don't even love me. I've got problems. If you love me, what is wrong with you? Tony and I, we work together. Yeah, she loves me, but, you know, we're working on things. But it's like, I know I'm, and for me to say, well, I love you. I'm a Christian. I just love everybody. No, I, I love you in the sense of Christ, that we're all welcome to Christ. But let's get started. We are on a journey. Paul even is going to say, not that I've already achieved it. I'm still trying. He says, my goal. Paul says this after writing all this. Year, my goal is that I might know him. Not that I've already obtained all this. But I press on that I might attain the fullness, that I might know Christ. Who's saying that? Paul, the one writing the scripture. It's like, so Paul, here's the target. Christ is the target. And Paul's going this way. He says, our unity is in Christ. He says, and I, I'm not even there yet. But if you're out here outside the church, oh, I just, I'm a Christian. I just love everybody. It's like, no, even Paul was still trying to know Christ. Work. And so he's talking about here. Let me read it in the NIV here. Read the full text. Oh, well, they don't see it. My purpose, verse 2, is that they may be encouraged, we'll talk about encouraged, in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. Now, you understand how much we've already talked about Christ. You can't just get born again and say, I know Christ. Right, you're born again, you've accepted him as a Savior, but even Paul says, not that I've already obtained it, I press on that I might know Christ. So even the Apostle Paul was still striving to know Christ. And just say, well, we, you know, we all just get along, we all know Christ, we're all born again and play badminton. It's like, what, where's your, you're, you're, you're going to falter. You're going to find out that you have no unity at all. 
in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. And now here's, here's these are great verses. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. When you, this target of Christ, when you get there, that's where all the riches are. That's riches of, I mean, like gold and Solomon silver. It's like, no, of not, it's like, that's where things make sense. That's where you can figure out the way the world works. You can see yourself clearly, others clearly. You can see the answers. It's within here. This is the way, the wisdom, the riches of wisdom. Uh, understand, okay, uh, who are hidden, the wisdom and knowledge. And now verse 4, now here it is. Are you ready for the key? i got to pick this up next week. I tell you this. It's like, why are, I mean, you can say, I'm being extreme, and that's fair. You should judge me. You should always judge me. And Paul, what's Paul saying? Why is he saying? It sounds like a lot of Christian lingo. He says, I, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. In other words, our target is Christ. He says, this is unity, that we're all going to come in, we all start out here, sinful creatures, everyone, and we all, we're all in the kingdom of darkness. We get saved, and we start our journey of knowing Christ, and the more we know Christ, the more unified we're We're not going to get unified here. This is not unity, because that's a sinful person, and that's a sinful person. If they do unite, they're uniting against Christ. They've got to Focus on Christ and find the unity in Christ. Now he says, the reason I tell you this, so someone doesn't confuse you with some, and he says, fine-sounding argument in the NIV. Meaning it's, it's not a stupid argument. It's like, hmm, presented at the university with the right PowerPoint, with the right speaker, with the right experience and degrees, you can't argue with this. Because if... Socially, we were to say, all just accept each other as individuals, and then you have all this research, footnotes, and then I mean, there is no God, because that, was just, that just causes division. Because now we've got to say, who's God? So there is no God. We all evolve, or whatever you want to put it there. And you start explaining it. It's like, and so now society is based on competition. And some people have, some people don't. And the people that don't have, they become evil. The people that have, they become good. So if we just would just give everybody the same thing, we just all come together, we form this, we'll call it Babel, and we'll build a society, a tower, where we'll all be equal. It's like, who in here is against that idea? Who's against treating each other equally? Hey, I didn't think so. So we're all in agreement, this is where we're going. Does anyone want to challenge, like, what about Christ? Christ? You mean religion? That causes the vision on our perfect, perfect world? It's like, uh, yeah, no, no, never mind. Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. And Paul's saying, this is where we're at. This is your unity. I tell you this, so someone doesn't blindside you with some sound, fine-sounding argument. And pretty soon your whole church... Yeah, it's okay if the universities go there, that's one thing. Or Hollywood goes there, that's one thing. Or the secular pagans go there, that's one thing. But when the church of Jesus Christ goes, yeah, let's get in on this. Because that's what we believe too. We believe in social justice and social equality and everyone's the same. we got to share. The church is all about sharing. The church's goal is that everyone is, is happy. Happy, yes. Christ came for happiness. Christ even recognized he had problems. I think if you look closely, it's apparent that Jesus sinned and had problems himself, but he realized he couldn't help us. And we just all needed to just cooperate and be, be unified. Jesus was talking about Jesus and John and Yoko basically saying the same thing. Do we all agree? It's like, uh, uh, no, I, I don't. What's wrong with that individual? You hate people. Oh my gosh. And now, if you've got a whole society think of this, you understand, how, how, how are you going to explain this? Well, we start with the church explaining it. <laughs> but then, like we're talking to the church, you've got to convince the pastor to say it. Because the pastor's going to have to tell these people this, but they're over here. But the pastor's over here, too. See, revival starts with the pastor. Pastor, 
Can you see this? Yeah, but that's going to really cause division. I know, you might have to get a job. Yeah, you, might, you might lose some people. You might have to make a commitment. You might be snatched from the lion's mouth. No, no, I would lose everything. Yeah, but you would preach the truth. No, no, I don't want to lose anything. I want to be protected from the lion. No, the lion is the lion is helping the lion, the beast. Satan is trying to build this. He is trying, his goal is to devour this right here. And to preach that, to teach that, you may be devoured temporally, but as Paul says, welcomed into an eternal kingdom. And uh, that's a decision. And I don't know, sometimes it's like I get excited to do it, but sometimes I look at it if there's repercussions. It's like, that's why, I like 2 Timothy, it was a real, real good book for me to just kind of read and study because it kind of spoke to us, you know, I want to just kind of stay low, just let the storm blow over. But when the storm gets done blowing over, there might not be anything left. Who was it? I'll tell you real quick, Facebook post, ended up with a Facebook post. I saw it, someone. I don't even know where it was from, I shouldn't even say this because I don't know the historical background of it. But there's two, two guys, and you, you may have heard it somewhere. There are two guys that were in some kind of prison. They've been taken, their society has been taken off. It wasn't, it wasn't Nazi Germany. It might have been Russia, where they just overthrew the society. And all they said, the government sent out all these troops to just take everybody and put them over here. And uh, the guy, one of the guys got out. He says, me and my friend, while we were in there, we were so mad at ourselves. Because when we were out there, we had a chance to defend ourselves, We could have said something. We could have did something. We could have fought back because there was more of us than there was of them. But we just, we just wanted to cooperate. We just didn't want any problems. So they told us to go over here. We just went. And then we lost everything and now we're captive and we have no way of fighting back. No one can hear us. There's nothing to fight with. We're just here. And we sat there, when well, his friend died, he says, but when I, he, says, I, then he says, the whole time we were there, it's like, if we just would have started back here before it was over. Now, that's something to take concern right here. The church is going to get sucked into this. The church is not going to stand up and proclaim Christ. And Christ, the Western civilization, i got to quit, but the Western civilization is based on Christianity. It's, it's based on the freedom of, of religion, that you can come to Christ freely. It, it, we can talk about the whole thing. Christianity is the foundation of Western civilization. If you undermine Christianity, Western civilization's got to collapse into the dark ages of whatever was before. So we don't want to fight a battle. We're not listening to fight a war. But I would like to have us fight for Christianity. And Christianity coming over here and cooperating with Babel is the most the damnable thing I can even think of. I mean that 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 I mean I can't even express how I hate this. Because people who think they're doing the right thing are over here just cooperating and they can't even understand or hear what Paul's saying here. He can't they don't even understand the epistles. They they they've neutered them. They've got love, unity, peace all over here but it's like no. That is only in Christ. So we'll continue here with uh, chapter 2, and I'll clean this up a little bit next week, and we'll continue. Thank you for being here. I'll pray, and you're free to go. Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. We ask again that we would judge our own hearts, that we would find strength in your word, that we would find the word of God and the spirit of God transforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. We ask that we would cooperate and follow after these things. And Father, we ask that we would be bold and that we would have clearness in the things we say, especially in the way we live our lives, that the world can see. We'd ask that you'd empower us when we come to confrontation, not that we'd be destructive or, or divisive, but Father, that we could stand up and proclaim your truth and shine a light. Many people are looking, people have been taken captive by false philosophies in the church and outside the church, and we've come to set the captives free with the truth of Jesus Christ. We ask that you'd empower us to do these things at this time in history in our nation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time.